Can I just say something? Of course you can. Um, it's very interesting now the film that you showed, Yasha, because um, you know that Mira actually had the, at one point, had the uh, strong desire to make film. Um, she, she, she never um, was able to get the, the sort of equipment or learn how to do it, but she wanted to do that. So instead, she produced these um, you know, little books where you you turn the pages and you see the movement of the of the line and, and or the letter. And it, and it with an effect very like a film. So that was fascinating to see that. Yeah. Do you think she had the intention of moving from the flick books towards an animated yes, film that would be I very so. similar? I, I think it would have been actually a film. I mean, you know, a projected film. Very interesting. And you just found this. I feel like I have to ask because I'm, I'm people are probably curious. You just found it sort of by chance. Yes, ready made. Fantastic. <laughs> Um, we've got, I think, about 20-ish minutes before breaking, so I, I just thought I might ask a couple of questions, see how we go, and then just make sure that there's time for... I, I feel quite certain that people are going to have questions for both of you. So, um, One question um, that I might ask to try and make a relationship between the two presentations was this uh, concern with the void, the full void that Guy mentioned, the sense of something being at once everything and nothing. And you can relate this within the world or the universe of concrete poetry to Dom Sylvester Huedad. Do you think this was a tendency within um, the wider field of concrete poetry to be concerned with the kind of emptying out language from its confidence in, in having the power to explain, of somehow questioning the capacity of language or the limits of language? What a difficult question. I wouldn't know where to start, really. You know, I'm sure there were some people that would question every full stop. But um, concrete poetry, that's why we have this map. It's because people came to it from every angle, you see. And so, um, for some people, a full stop would be like micro dot photograph, which has everything in it. And for other people, it would be the last thing, after which there would be nothing else. Mm -hmm. And um, so, it depends on the people. and. Concrete poetry, as a movement, attracted people from lots of walks of life, partly because they could do it by themselves, because it really didn't cost money. I mean, if you think of what Dom Sylvester Werdar did, and he did an enormous quantity of concrete poems on his typewriter, and he was in Prinich Abbey in Gloucestershire. And I often wondered, as I saw the quantity of his output, didn't he have to do any work there <laughs> in the Abbey? Or wasn't he somehow employed? And I think that maybe he wasn't. Maybe he just was there, and they treated him as their sort of Abbey artist and let him get on with it. They didn't pay too much attention to the work and it was sent out all over the world. But after he died, nobody would, could go and look at it anymore. You know, suddenly it became precious. That was quite interesting. So it wasn't at all precious because there were just bits of paper and the typewriter uh, who is the red and dark blue ribbon, which, and of course that was getting worn out, and there are some poems where the blue and the red don't show up very much, or where the red shows up more than the blue, because that's what he was using more. So this is the kind of thing. So what he had to do was to beg from his friends enough money to buy a ribbon or postage stamps to get that stuff around and so on and so on. 
Uh, and now, of course, there's a conference about Dom Sylvester Ada, South London Art Gallery on the 2nd of December, whole day devoted mm -hmm. to him. Another thing he did was, because um, he used, uh, always used a letter, an Olivetti letter of 22 to do all his typewriter poems. Um, you know, where, either, you know, the, in the, I, I don't know what it's called technically, but the roller, the roll, yes. um, has a kind of ratchet on it, you know, so ch -ch 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 -ch. Yes. you took the ratchet off so that he could roll it and all, you know, he could sort of easily slip the paper into the time and take it out again. So it wouldn't be line, one line after another. It was loose. Yes, loose, yes, exactly. That's right. That's right. So you could roll so it up and the down. typewriter yeah. in order to be able to, especially yeah. the ones that are very, the visual mm -hmm. constructions. Yeah. Mm. I, I think you're right. It's a, it's a really, I think I was thinking about this for the past couple of days that you get a sense um, both from his work, from Dom Sylvester Huedard's work and Mira Schendel's work, of having the ability to have large periods of time, which is something that, that the, the sort of the, the richness of time yes. is something that's quite difficult to relate to now. Um, and at the same time, um, I'm very drawn to the comparative kind of economic yes. e economy of, of materials and the I suppose the agility that mm -hmm. having this kind of practice allows where, where you're able to carry on and you don't have the, the great kind of obstacles of needing mm -hmm. huge material resources in order to work. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking of this in relationship to um, what you were saying, Guy, of the ability for you and Paul to go to Brazil, see the work and say, well, let's exhibit it. And Signal similarly always struck me as an organisation that had this capacity to be quite agile. A certain yeah. freedom. Yeah. Well, we weren't quite so bound by administrative, you know, sort of pressures and, uh, um, and, and the extraordinarily complicated thing of everything became so much more complicated than, than it seemed to be then. Um, became managed. <laughs> yeah. I don't know whether I'm idealising this historical moment, perhaps I am. But um, it, did, it did strike me that um, the way you could respond to work at, at Signals, it wasn't a question of, you didn't know, necessarily know what you were expecting, but you had a strong intuition that you could feed it into a, um, an overall picture of the art that you were interested in was. Um, and similarly with concrete poetry, it, was, it wasn't something that, that had to be sort of managed and define itself and al allow people within it as some kind of canon, but it was much more expansive in a sense. Mm. We allowed international, for I mean. ephemera. You know, the thing exists and then it stops existing. And it was somehow taken for granted. Like you mentioned Li Wancha. Mm. I remember his exhibition um, in Bell Street and Listen Gallery. And there was a room which consisted of a swing hung from the ceiling and pile, I mean a huge pile, of autumn leaves. That was all. And if you visited, you sat in the swing, you swung and you left. <laughs> <laughs> do you remember I, that? I do, I, I do, I do. <laughs> I do. And, and I wonder if we've come, if we, if we are able to come into any conclusions about whether Mira Schendel's work has anything to do with concrete poetry or what it is that makes us ask that question. Is it just because the, there is language used in a visual sense and therefore it is concrete poetry in an expanded definition? Concrete, the, word, the phrase concrete poetry seems to be a little bit more precise than visual poetry. Although I think visual poetry is a probably a better title because you know, it can it yes. can cover it can uh, it can cover more, yes, and and more. And have clay. Mm. Yes, any painter who used letters and words, it's true. Was it an association that you made on on seeing her work and knowing the context of concrete poetry in England and Brazil? When you saw it, did you make that relationship? I, 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 I don't know. I think I, uh, I was interested in all use of the, wo of the word. 
Um, for example, Elio Oiticica was incorporating words in his Parangole, mm -hmm. um, which made them into visual poems, really, in, 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 in one level, in one, in one incarnation. Um, so, um, but I, I, that, that very formal kind of concrete poem, um, I, I, I find I found fascinating. The one that you showed, the combination of the triangle and the rectangle. Oh yes, and Oh yes, that's yes. right. And also the other thing was um, the uh, poetry of, uh, of punctuation. Oh yes, I didn't know about that. Yes. That's, That's wonderful. I mean, mm. there's oh, a lot of... How far was that taken? I mean, did it... Oh, well, the books. It, yeah. You this showed a, a little... A Polish, yes, Polish, Polish artist. Yes. There, in Poland, there was a lot of visual poetry and concrete poetry. The mm. term was never used, of course. And also in Czechoslovakia, there was a lot. And um, I think you remarked at, at a certain point that you now, in the present day, associate a kind of um, the sense that concrete poetry is something to do with the future of language, that it somehow points towards the status of language now, which I think is something that quite a lot of concrete poets see themselves as, or saw themselves at the time, as, be, as somehow kind of predicting a future in which language would be used differently, in which our relationship to language would be very different. Yes, I, I think... Um Dom Sylvester, he when he wrote prose, uh, yes, he he had you know he had a a, 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 star, a, a style that was um, very particular. I mean, it's full, full of abbreviations and, and sort of because it was, um, you know, trying it, it it was in motion really. So. Yes. Yes. And you would well, associate that with with what I suppose we can. Kinetic. I mean, yeah. He called it King Kong. King Kong, kinetic, Con concrete, King Kong. Um, I think that we should take some questions from the floor, um, if mm. presumably yes. there are some. I think people are tired. I, I, just to break the ice, uh, and, uh, <laughs> I was quite... Um, it, it, so it's really hard to kind of imagine what um, the type of exchanges, uh, friendships and correspondences um, were like um, 40, 50 years ago. But um, I'm quite interested in, in um, discovering these um, kind of often quite informal um, um, meetings and, and, and uh, Often through through sheer coincidence, and um, there's a kind of uh, it seems to me um, that there, there was a kind of uh, amateurist in, in in the best possible sense of the word um, kind of context around around a lot of um, this type of correspondence, whether uh, within uh, artistic circles. Um, uh, most certainly uh, through through um, kind of experimental photography, for example, and I'm, I'm wondering if that also happened in terms of the the circuits of uh, concrete poetry. I'm thinking particularly in the um, amateur photographer clubs, which uh, became a kind of an international mm. phenomenon. I mean, uh, people would exhibit in these uh, kind of uh, very low budget organized exhibitions, but. Uh, Photographs of people would travel the world, and, and uh, it was a kind of an, an international uh, network of. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of thinking whether that is a kind of good example uh, um, to, 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 in which to kind of be able to imagine uh, how, how um, exchanges within um, avant garde poetry or, or even. Um, amongst the Vanguard artists uh, well, there, there took a, place. I think there was a sort of connection between concrete poetry and, and mail art. Yes. Mm -hmm. Sending work through the mail. Um, a method which was, which was very beautifully um, developed by Eugenio Ditborn in Chile. But he, he really did uh, originally start making his air mail paintings in order to uh, that they to exhibit them in different parts of the world without he, transport costs. 
but there was, yeah. I mean, but there was the, the journey of the work was part of the poetic of the work. You, you, the journey was traced on every envelope um, as as the work went from one place to another. I think the key to all this is paper. You know, if it's paper, photograph is paper, etc. It will travel. It can be cardboard, but still paper. True. I think that is the, the key. And that is the basic material for most art, or what we yes. start with. I got very used to these um, airmail envelopes coming from Brazil, the green and, green and yellow um, airmail. Have you yeah, kept um, them? I kept a few, yes. I think there's something also that um, is of, of relevance to, to Mira Schendel's work as a whole, that, that, you were, that, that in a way she was an amateur, or she was not professionalised, which is a sort of a, a, good, a, good, a good reason to be an amateur. And the universe of concrete poetry was almost like a giant open submission exhibition, mm. in a sense. And I think that perhaps this is why the work causes so many contradictions is because she wasn't um, directing it towards a sort of certain presupposed, mm. professionalised box, but that, like concrete poetry, like these other kind of um, universes of, of interconnected practices, um, she was able to sort of circumvent somehow um, being within a I'm a professionalised artist box and producing the work in her kitchen or or through discussion and exhibiting it in not only in kind of gallery context in a way. Mm. Oh, sorry, it's you. Guy, I was very glad that you explained how she acquired all that rice paper because I kept thinking it must be very expensive to get to Brazil. <laughs> Do you think there's any possibility that her, and I can't say the, the word in Portuguese, the little nothings, the knotted papers, were rejected works? No, well, they didn't have any marks on them. I mean, they were, So she must have gotten a huge amount and of rice paper. Unless inside somewhere, because they're very dense, and maybe inside somewhere. I mean, she, she must have had them, because she made hundreds and hundreds of those monotypes, and then you can conceive of how much paper those little nothings would have... they're so thin that actually... Uh, to, to twist them around and turn them There'd be a lot contained in a pile that yeah. high would be a yeah, lot. Ma right? So she, she must have had either massive... I mean, someone really gifted her something. It was just an amazing kind of... Who gave it to her? Do we know? No. Um, she just says a gift from a friend, yeah, I think. Something like that, yes. But presumably yeah. it would have been in Sao Paulo amongst the kind of um, materials you would have found in the Japanese quarter of Sao Paulo, for example. This is from my imagination. <laughs> I think it was probably my machine back that got to her from uh, his trips to... Ah, interesting. So what was that? That it could have been um, from Mario Schenberg via his travels outside of Brazil to China and, and Japan. I'll we'll find out one day. I'd like to link um, two things together to address both of you. Um, the question of the void, and I'm just thinking of a completely dif different tradition of thinking the void. Um, I'm just M Morris Blanchot as writing the disaster, um, which is a book looking at a topology with an extreme limit, which is the void, and both at a you know, catastrophes at a cosmological level, but also using Winnicott and the void, the fear of breakdown or psychosis. So a kind of void at the heart of subjectivity is a kind of traumatic wound. And I want to link this with this idea from somebody, I mean, this, I'll use Nietzsche, that with the death of God, you know, the way the brain is, the subject is structured um, will be reflected in the way language, so grammar shouldn't be there in the same way after the death of God, living through the period of the death of God historically. So the idea that grammar and subjectivity and the way language is structured is very linked with being held in place or confirmed by a sort of higher, higher being. And I just wonder, I mean, clearly what's come to me uh, from all the papers in the last two days is that Miri Shandell 
was very protect. She had a kind of um, mystical jouissance. Perhaps this is what I'm picking up, without knowing her and her work, which protected her against that kind of understanding of uh, the void. You know, some kind of primordial wound that might be inflicted by language at the birth of subjectivity, or any sense of the void as a cat cat catastrophic, whether it's the Big Bang or mm. dark black holes or psychical black holes, or even the antagonisms, political antagonisms, if you think of the catastrophe of Europe that she escaped from. And, and yet um, this isn't somehow, I mean, her work isn't decorative, but she's incarnating or manufacturing a, a sort of a, 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 um, something which is a full void, but it doesn't have the ag an agonism or the... Mm. The disorder, a terrifying disorder, the terror of uncertain meaning that one might get if you see, you know, language breaking down, like a missing signifier for a psychotic, you know, just can't protect you from the real. So, you know, hallucinations are the protection against this, against the void. So I just am very interested uh, as to, this has been sort of absent from the discussion. And considering her life, it's strange that it is absent. I can understand it being absent in her discourse or in her con discussions, because conversations, because you know, trauma is not is you know, you, it's something that re you repress, have to repress. But I just wondered uh, what you make of this, because I feel that the Zen or the mysticism is perhaps a different enjoyment or jouissance of the void than one that confronts the. Yes, I've got it. Work is the protection against the void. And that's what she did. We've already agreed she did a lot of it, and all the time. So I think that is, that's, that would be my answer. Not the only one, but mine. There are some, there are some things of mirrors that I don't really know why she produced them. And um, if I'd just seen those and nothing else of hers, I wouldn't have been interested at all. You think of anything uh, in particular? Those, those, um, the, the, those mandalas and things I was doing mm -hmm. in the end, which um, don't seem to be interesting as forms or in their colouring. And I couldn't associate them with her. But obviously, in some way, she liked... Maybe it's if he, just a sort of um, assumption of freedom, but yeah. she she liked she liked to get concerned with all kinds of things which um, don't seem to have a lasting interest. Yeah. I, mean, I, if I, I don't know if I'm being unfair there, but but you know how you you either, either the way in which you respond to something and uh, my first view of one of her monotypes and and its emptiness. Um, still remains as mm. something very, very powerful. But if you'd met her at a different moment when she was producing the more something like the Mandela works, that mm. attraction would not no, necessarily. No, there wouldn't occurred. have been any attraction. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I think that I think there's a relationship between what you're saying, Jean, and, and Guy's reading of the void. Maybe not as an explicit relationship to Schendel's own trauma if you like but the fact that the the more um that this understanding of the void is like turning around the void is something to be feared in a crisis and turning it into something you can live with turning uncertainty into something you can live with um i think it, no, it makes sense to me i think maybe if it hasn't been talked about explicitly today it's somehow been there as as a as something to be grasped about a way of, in a way, a way of, of, of making sense of her biography as well, because those are kind of a, um, a set of very extreme circumstances that would obviously have, have related, have affected her relationship to, to language in particular, and that, that sense it gives you a belonging to a certain place or a certain, even a certain conception of what's real, I suppose. Mm. I don't know if this is, is common again. I, I'm sorry I keep on asking these general questions about concrete poetry, whether there is a, a, a common tendency that 
those that contribute will, will also have passed through more than one language in their lifetime or have been kind of um, split from their native language, if you yes. like. Yes, yes, certainly. I mean, for instance, Gomringer, born in Bolivia, educated and living in Bern. And then he writes the poem Silencio, and he's always writing in Spanish. Mm. And then Ben said it's on writing in Spanish. That's quite interesting. And, and so on. So, uh, because language travels, but not terribly accurately. <laughs> so the word spirit doesn't mean less free, mm. and so on. So this is, so if you need less free, you put it in an English mm -hmm. poem, that kind of thing. Another thing, uh, one thing that came up, uh, one thing that I think Brian Ifair was um, asking or t uh, talking about yesterday, Legibility and I illegibility. Um, I suppose one could apply that to something like Schwitter's Ur Sonata, because it and and the, and the borderline between in intelligible and, inte and uh, intelligible and unintelligible sound. But. You mean intelligible, you mean that it has to be, have recognizable words, but it doesn't really. No. Maybe you have, it, it's a question of whether you can be sure of what it means. Yes. Well, I mean, I don't know what, but uh, when you hear it, you know, you imagine. Well, a, a, a lot of, quite a lot of words are onomatopoeic yes. anyway that they... Yes conjure up a sound yes. and and the tra there's a transcript of um, the earth sonata i think oh yes oh what do you mean translation uh, no into a transcript it's um, a scripted script version oh yes absolutely that is of course and what i showed was just a little bit of it mm. and and there are people who travel around the world performing it because yes. it requires very special talent and voice. <laughs> and, you know, it's like performing music or like being an opera singer. Mm -hmm. You perform Schwitters. I heard it performed at uh, the Royal College of Art um, by somebody. I uh -huh. Perhaps it was one of these people who travel around. Maybe. But it, was, it, was quite, <laughs> it was quite incredible. It is it, incredible. It really was. It is incredible. Um, I'm going to see if there's maybe one final question before we break for tea. Sorry, less, less a question, more just an observation that was brought out just now by Eurasia when you were talking about language traveling not well. And that's in a way reflects back exactly to one of the speakers yesterday who was talking about how Mira would use whichever word in whichever language was most appropriate. So maybe she was always speaking concrete poetry and just didn't know. <laughs> natural language. <laughs> yes, nice. I, was, uh, I was wondering why she was suddenly, you know, there are some words in Portuguese and then there's this whole sentence in Italian, you know. So. Fantastic. Thank you. That was a beautiful question to end with. So yes, um, how long are we breaking for, Tanya? 45 minutes. 45 minutes and then... And then the projection.